and the family are back in good spirit for a new series on Tuesday, January the 6th at 8.30. Where's the meat? We don't need meat. Of course we need meat. It's Christmas. We need tons of it. Bill and Ben are having a vegetarian Christmas. Or are they? We have absolutely no food left in the house or at Rona's. And tomorrow is Christmas Day. Will Bill do the dastardly deed? Well, it is Christmas. 2.4 children at 8.15 Christmas Eve on BBC One. A rather unexpected catch for the Ghostbusters of East Finchley on BBC Two now. Here will they strike oil or disaster drama with the Roughnecks in half an hour. Before that, on BBC One, the nine o'clock news with Peter Sissons. Prince Charles says that after he's divorced, he's no intention of marrying again. The Prince responds quickly to the Queen's letter calling for an early divorce. But the princess remains silent as speculation mounts about a divorce settlement and her future role. And John Major says pretending that Sinn Féin is separate from the IRA is a laughable fiction. Good evening. The Prince of Wales said today he does not intend to remarry after his divorce. He's already indicated he agrees with the Queen's request for the royal couple to bring their marriage to an end. Today's announcement is intended to end speculation that the Prince may marry Camilla Parker Bowles. But many questions remain, not least what future role the Princess of Wales might play. As yet, there's no word from the Princess. She's said to have been devastated by the Queen's letters to the couple becoming public. With one avalanche of rumour now cleared, yes, he does want a divorce, the Prince has moved decisively to sweep aside another. While he was on a private visit near Cheltenham, his spokesman announced that he has no intention of remarrying. He clearly wants to end the speculation about whether he has any ambition to marry his long-term mistress, Camilla Parker Bowles, and even to make her queen. He has also removed some of the difficulties with which he could have presented the church. Well, I think that if we had gone into a different situation, and his statement is enormously helpful, uh, then we might have found ourselves in some difficulties uh, because the Supreme Governor of the Church of England might then have been doing something which is different from the official teaching of the Church of England. But we're not in that situation, and in that sense, the Prince of Wales has been very helpful to have clarified his position. The Princess, who took her sons to her health club today, has still given no indication of when she will answer her mother-in-law's letter urging her to divorce. The ball is now in her court, but ironically, because of that brutally frank interview she gave to Panorama a month ago, she's now facing the prospect of something she wasn't looking for. I don't want a divorce, but obviously we need clarity on the situation. This has been of enormous discussion over the last three years in particular. So all I say to that is that I await my husband's decision on which way we are all going to go. In the years since they've been officially separated, the princess has been an unpredictable force within the royal family. Only this week she suddenly changed her mind about spending Christmas at Sandringham. That's said to be unconnected with the moves towards divorce. But as far as the Queen is concerned, Panorama transformed a private matter into a public issue, which was in danger of harming the monarchy and the country. She therefore took the initiative, where neither the prince nor the princess had wanted to be the first to act. The Queen was waiting uh, to see if there was some kind of reconciliation, if something uh, could in fact be done, but it was now clear that nothing could be done, things would go on getting worse, and the Queen's duty ultimately is to the country. And uh, this display of disunity within the royal family was damaging national unity as well as the monarchy itself. The princess has some tricky negotiations ahead. If she's to be given the roving ambassador role she wants, she will have to agree to a divorce. The precise status that she's looking for is unclear, but it's the sort of work she's been doing around the world for some years. In Paris, for example, raising money for Bernardo's. And the charities she works for believe she will remain just as important to them if and when she is no longer the wife of the Prince of Wales. We want to encourage her to go on speaking out about 
those things which are wrong in our society and which we need to address, particularly insofar as they affect children and young people. And so we're very much looking forward to, to uh, a new phase of a relationship with the princess. Talks about her role are still going on, and as she considers her response, palace officials will have in mind the warning she sounded last month. She won't go quietly, that's the problem. I'll fight till the end, because I believe that I have a role to fulfill, and I've got two children to bring up. Unlimited access to her sons will be her first priority. They also represent her trump card, because whatever else happens, she'll always be the mother of the future king. And as such, she'll be provided for. Jenny Bond, BBC News. The Prime Minister, who'd been informed about the Queen's decision to ask the royal couple to seek an early divorce, refused to comment today. But the Deputy Prime Minister, Michael Heseltine, called the move sad but inevitable. Our political editor, Robin Oakley, reports. The Prime Minister, who's seen both the Prince and Princess of Wales in the past fortnight, has a key role to play in achieving a divorce settlement between the heir to the throne and his wife, who does not trust the palace establishment. He's known to believe that a worthwhile role must be found for the mother of a future king, though in public today he was cautious in the extreme. I've nothing, uh, whatever, further to say to the statement that was issued last night by Buckingham Palace. That crystal uh, crystallises the position. It's a matter that's being dealt with. I'm nothing further to add on that. Surely, Prime Minister, you must have something to say, shouldn't you? It's a major public issue. I have nothing to say issue. to you this morning about that issue. Other party leaders joined in expressing sympathy for the royal couple and acknowledging the need to fashion a role for the princess. I think that most people, myself included, would like to see, should a divorce take place, some role for Princess Diana, um, some chance for her to use the undoubted ability and esteem that she has in the interests of the country. The first thing that has to happen is that they should be given the space to sort out what they believe is right for themselves personally, for their children, as any married couple would, and because they're a special married couple, in relation to the public duties that they do. And I'd like to see them given that space. Sixty years ago, Stanley Baldwin's role as Prime Minister was to force Edward VIII to step down as king before his coronation because public opinion would not tolerate his marrying Mrs. Wallace Simpson, a divorcee. But in today's changed public climate, divorce is this time seen by politicians and palace as the way of preventing further damage to the monarchy through the royal couple's media-born bickering. Divorce would prevent the princess becoming queen, but experts see no other significant constitutional fallout. A divorce between the Prince and Princess of Wales would not present any kind of constitutional problem, and in particular it would not affect the right of the Prince of Wales to succeed to the throne when the present Queen dies. Some people think it's a problem because of the position of the Church of England, and of course in England the Sovereign is Supreme Governor of the Church of England, but that's a purely symbolic position. It is, though, the princess's desire to become some kind of roving ambassador for Britain, as on her recent visit to Argentina, which could provide the political headache. There's no doubt of her media pulling power and her value to charity, but the Foreign Office is uneasy about royal superstars taking on any kind of diplomatic role. Some senior politicians point out that Britain, unlike the US or the UN, has no culture of amateur roving ambassadors. Mr. Major, cast in the role of honest broker, is likely to face his thorniest task in seeking to establish the ground rules defining the princess's future public role. But satisfying her ambitions in that regard is likely to prove the key to winning her agreement to an early divorce. Robin Oakley, BBC News, Downing Street. Lawyers representing the Prince and Princess of Wales are expected to meet at the beginning of next year to negotiate the terms of a divorce settlement. Our legal correspondent, Joshua Rosenberg, looks at the issues involved. Like so many engaged couples, Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer apparently started with the best of intentions, although even in 1981 the prince seemed a little uncertain. I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> The couple's first child was born a year after their wedding. Prince Harry was to follow his brother, Prince William, in 1984. But by 1992, the princess was sending an unmistakable message to the world. She was now a woman alone. 
and again, like so many couples, they've called in the divorce lawyers. But it may be some time before the solicitors agree on a settlement. The princess's lawyer, Anthony Julius, is away from his office until the beginning of January. So too is Henry Boyd Carpenter, solicitor to the Prince of Wales. Once they've agreed terms, a divorce could be obtained within three months. The first stage is for a divorce petition to be issued and sent by one spouse to the other. The court papers are then studied by a district judge who will decide if a divorce should be granted. In that case, a decree nisi would be pronounced in open court some six weeks or more after the petition was issued. Six weeks later, a decree absolute may be granted to dissolve the marriage. A divorce won't be granted unless the court is satisfied about where the two young princes will live and when they'll see their parents. The princess certainly won't agree to a divorce unless she's satisfied that she'll have regular contact with her children. But lawyers don't foresee problems. The question of the custody of children probably will fall into place fairly easily. Um, custody now, under English law, only uh, becomes an issue if there's a real dispute between the parents. And it's so likely that Charles and Diana will agree about their children, as they appear to have done over the time since they've been separated, that it won't be a problem. But one thing is different. A key role will be played by the grandmother of the two young princes. By law, the sovereign has the right to decide how the young princes should be brought up and educated. That was certainly the majority view of the judges when they were asked for their opinion in 1717. They told King George I, the education and care of your grandchildren, including the eldest son of the Prince of Wales, do belong of right to your majesty as king of this realm. The prince's net income of one and a half million pounds last year came from properties owned by the Duchy of Cornwall, including the model village of Poundbury near Dorchester. On that basis, the Princess of Wales could hope to receive maintenance of around £600,000 a year. Observers believe that her financial future is secure. I think the fact is that she's going, going to have an official royal role of some sort, even if it's a semi-detached one and therefore she's going to be provided for very handsomely by the royal family and perhaps by the government. If she has an official role, she'll be given an official royal residence and I don't think we need to worry about her financial future. It's now likely that the royal marriage, which was solemnised with such high hopes in St Paul's Cathedral, will come to a sad end just a short walk away here at the Divorce Registry in Somerset House. Joshua Rosenberg, BBC News. Later in the news, we'll be looking at changing attitudes towards divorce in Britain. Now, other news. The Prime Minister has said the Northern Ireland peace process is making steady progress. He was speaking after a meeting with his Irish counterpart, John Bruton, in Dublin. The two leaders praised the efforts of the international body set up to negotiate the handing over of arms. Earlier in Belfast, Mr Major said it was laughable to describe Sinn Féin and the IRA as two wholly separate organisations. John Major and John Bruton have had many meetings before, but few as informal as tonight. Both leaders stopping off in a Dublin pub for a pint of stout. For Mr Major, it was nearing the end of a long day, taking in Ireland both south and north. In Ballymena, County Antrim this morning, he met the teetotal Ian Paisley, normally anything but a political ally, as local MP Dr Paisley was willing to extend Mr Major a civil welcome. The Prime Minister condemned the two murders in Belfast this week and had this challenge for Republicans. They're trying to maintain a fiction that I think most people in Northern Ireland will find laughable that Sinn Féin and the IRA are wholly separate organisations. We know that not to be true. The people of Northern Ireland know that not to be true. And they would be far, they would be far better spending their time determining on how they can carry the process forward. But speaking to reporters in Belfast this afternoon, Gerry Adams rejected that. He needs to talk to some of his own people. Because not only are we two separate entities, but in the course of our uh, interchanges and dialogue with representatives of Mr. Major's government, they have acknowledged that Sinn Féin and the IRA are not the same. At the two Prime Ministers' joint press conference in Dublin this evening, John Bruton didn't entirely concur with Mr. Major that Sinn Féin and the IRA were one and the same thing. As, uh, Sinn Féin is a political party, whereas the IRA is an illegal organisation. Uh, we, as far as the Irish government is concerned, deplore the killings that have occurred in 
Belfast in recent times, we are not in a position to make any judgment as to where the specific organisational responsibility for those barbarities rests. The two leaders do have different views on the best way forward in the peace process, but tonight they made a point of brushing those differences aside. They want relations between the UK and Ireland across a broad plane to become as warm as their own personal rapport. Mark Devonport, BBC News, Dublin. The American Defence Secretary, William Perry, has said that all sides in Bosnia are complying with the ceasefire and that peace in the country is an emerging reality. At the same time, the European Union, the World Bank and the United States have pledged more than £300 million to start the rebuilding work in Bosnia. NATO summoned the military commanders of all three sides to their first meeting today. They're not General Mladic, who's wanted for war crimes. The Bosnian Serbs sent his deputy instead. The very fact that they all turned up and on time shows that they're taking NATO much more seriously than the UN. 24 hours into their mission, NATO commanders are quite content with the way things are going. Their ostentatious display of military muscle seems to be working. We have British forces that have moved well into Bosnian Serb territory and they have been welcomed there. Uh, we've had American general drive from Tuzla up north towards the Sava River and he has been welcomed there. Michael Portillo flew into Sarajevo for a few hours with a Christmas message for the troops. They have all of the nation behind them. It was made very clear in the House of Commons. I know, I know that it's felt amongst the public as well that everyone is supporting our men and women out here because they know that they're doing a difficult and possibly dangerous job in the cause of bringing peace to the people of Bosnia and Herzegovina. NATO's arrival is making ordinary Bosnians feel more secure and increasingly thoughts are turning to the task of restoring their lives. Electricity is slowly being turned back on and there's work for years to come for the city's glaziers. The devastation is enormous. The National Library was one of Bosnia's cultural treasures. More than 300 years old, it was destroyed in a single night of shelling. In the long run, Bosnia needs the West's money more than it needs her troops. For if the next 12 months brings no visible sign of improvement to life, then it's going to be much harder to guarantee a lasting peace. Tom Carver, BBC News, Sarajevo.